Thank you. I have a long run. <laughs> My coffee is right there. Good morning, everyone. We'll get started in one minute. So, good morning, everyone. As people are trickling in, we're going to welcome you to Nicola World Day 2. And we've got a presentation here from two companies on behalf of Nicola and Nell. The presentation is called Hygiene at Scale, Nicola and Nell. So, um, congratulations. It was a great, great event uh, yesterday. Uh, thank you very much for having us. And you know, what a, what a beautiful truck. I think that's exactly the way to do it, to, 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 to launch it like that. It really deserves it. Um, now, uh, we are a company that has been around for 90 years. So we, we know uh, a thing or two about hydrogen. Uh, we have installed uh, equipment in more than 80 countries. Uh, and uh, we have installed more than 3,500 electrolyzers around the world. But this is really one of the most exciting projects that we've ever been involved in. Uh, so, so, um, so that is really, really nice to be here. And I've told Jesse many times, Nell will do whatever we can to make sure that you are a success with your story. Obviously, Nicola being, uh, becoming a successful help also Nell becoming successful. However, there is a bigger thing uh, here. You will really you know, show the world how how this is done, how you really take heavy duty transportation and merge it with hydrogen exactly the way it should be done. Exactly the way it should be done. So we want to be a part of changing the world. Thank you for, for having us. It's great to have you here and work together to bring these stations to market. So what is hydrogen at scale? We're talking about bringing simultaneously the fuel cell truck, the Class A truck you saw yesterday unveiled, plus <coughs> hydrogen station uh, to market at the same time. Starting around 2022, before that, we've got a few development uh, steps in between that we're going to show you in a minute. Uh, what's really cool about the truck you saw yesterday, this 600 plus miles, this 2,000 foot pounds of torque, this 1,000 horsepower, all with zero emissions. At the same time, to, to fuel these, we're working uh, together with Nell on fast fueling. In fact, we're working with a large partnership we're going to get into a little later uh, that was looking to get 10 minute fueling for these large trucks equal to, equal to what you have today. Uh, it's, at the same time, we're planning to do this first in, in the West Coast and then bring that across country along with these, our dealerships, along with our customers, I should say, and along with these warehouses of trucks. Uh, we also have, we have a mantra, we are trying to take the vehicle out of the carbon equation by removing the, the carbon from the feedstock. With all those fossil fuels that we're trying to go away from and we're trying to go to renewable energy. And we're also looking to do this uh, and bringing this to market at every, every one of our stations, we'd like them to be interoperable. We'd love to sell hydrogen to, to the other automakers, and we'd love for us to be able to drive to other, other, car, other, other stations. That's the interoperability. So, we're producing hydrogen on site. So every one of our stations is gonna have hydrogen production. Our standard station is gonna be producing about eight tons a day. 
That's going to be with renewable energy supplemented by low carbon grid energy. Okay, so um, the beauty with the business model of Nicola is that it solves two things at the same time when it comes to, I'm now talking about the tuning station in Israel. First of all, it solves the chicken and the egg. Everything comes at the same time, the station comes at the same time as the trucks. But secondly, you, should, we saw, you solve the issue related to <coughs> capacity utilization. Because you have, the station will actually be used very, very quickly as you ramp up the trucks, the station will be used. And that's some of the challenges when you build infrastructure for hydrogen for all applications that you need to sit and wait for the customer. In this case, you, you don't need to do that. And that is really great because it really drives down cost and it allows you to basically produce and deliver hydrogen which is competitive with diesel, which is basically out competing uh, diesel. Uh, the other thing which I think is worth pointing out, and which I think is a, a service to society that Nikola is doing, is illustrated by this car on the screen here. Uh, basically, with every heavy duty station, uh, we are also going to put in light duty vehicle stations, which is great. So, so basically, anyone that is, uh, is running a hydrogen car can come to the station and basically fuel also their cars. I think that's a great service in society. Absolutely. So, this is a picture of uh, taken uh, not too long ago outside the, the headquarter, uh, a few miles from here. Uh, and we saw uh, part of the team, uh, Jesse's team here. Um, I was lucky enough to be there for meetings uh, early in March, just as the station was put, uh, put down uh, and connected, and now it's been tried and tested, uh, fuel trucks and cars, also your car, I believe. Right. So, so um, uh, and, and this station is obviously a demo station. It's the first one, it's a bit it's smaller. It's a car station which has been tweaked to also fuel uh, trucks, but it still has uh, the biggest, we believe, gaseous storage facility for hydrogen, one ton of hydrogen is stored um, in America. Maybe even the world, I, I'm not sure exactly. So, and you can obviously, with one ton of hydrogen, you can fuel a lot of cars and a lot of trucks. Exactly. And one thing in that picture you couldn't see so, so well, that there's a trailer right behind that team in that first hydrogen station. And we wanted to show you just a little bit of the innovation happening at Nikola. It's not just that we're developing a truck, it's we're also helping and working together in partnership with Nell on developing fueling protocols and stations. And we've developed what's called essentially tank on wheels, this hydrogen station testing apparatus. Our engineers have worked tirelessly to get this, this thing up and running, but basically it's taking the hydrogen storage system from the truck with the tank controller and it's bringing them up to the station. The reason that's significant is because we can use that also uh, to commission stations before we get started, testing, and also further optimization of our onboard storage regarding the, the tank controller. So we're gonna have communications between the vehicle and the station, and this is the device that tests both the fueling and the communications for that. So this is one of the great things with working with Nicola. They're really pushing us as a supplier, and that's what we like to do because we want to become better also. I think what you just showed us is an example of exactly that. So clean, zero emission fuel, no compromise. That is what we are trying to achieve here. And if you want to do clean, zero emission fuel, you obviously need to start with renewable energy. Uh, electricity is harvested, harvested from from uh, solar wind and it's used to split uh, water in our electrolyzers into oxygen and hydrogen and, and uh, this is a technology which is truly tested over many many years so it's a very robust reliable technology uh, and they are also one of the most efficient electrolyzers that are in the market so you're basically converting a very high percentage of electricity uh, into hydrogen which is really good for the whole business case now with the 700 bar uh, pressure and the tank system that you have in your trucks, you will then be able to fuel up to 80 kilos, which will give you superior range uh, in terms of you know, any other zero emission truck, but also diesel. And again, out completing diesel. If you go into a bit more details, 
Um, the Nikola station will also produce hydrogen on site, which I think is also a very key differentiator. Uh, you don't have to transport with the diesel station, you need to transport the fuel from an oil refinery far, far away. Here we actually produce it on site, reducing transportation quite significantly. That has an environmental impact, which is important, but maybe even more important in this case, it reduces a lot of cost if you don't have to transport. So, so, um, so that is really uh, another key element here, which is distinguishing Nikola from everyone else. You will find smaller stations around the world that also produce on-site, but never at this scale, never at this scale. So this is our eight ton uh, a day uh, station concept. Um, we are tied to renewable energy, uh, long-term uh, contract, less than 470 kilowatt hour. The majority of the cost of electrolysis is tied to electricity. If you have low cost electricity, you have low cost hydrogen, which is great. Um, you will then be able to produce large scale volumes uh, on site without transportation, giving you the opportunity to sell hydrogen to the end customer at around about less than, less than $6 per kilo. And to put that into perspective, that is almost half the price that we see most other customers of hydrogen are, uh, are having to pay in many, many other par parts of the world. So this is, you know, another... Some of that development's happening here. You saw the picture of this yesterday. Uh, we've, we've got three buildings that, that Nikola is, is developing. In Coolidge, we're doing a, a production. That's where our trucks are going. We have a main headquarters for the vehicle development. That's going to be in Phoenix. And around Chandler area, there's going to be an uh, R&D center that has, right in the backyard, a two-ton-a-day development station, which is going to be open next year. We're actually also going to have a fleet of trucks that's going to be testing right in the backyard. Uh, of course, under the roof, as we talked about yesterday, we're going to be doing fuel cell testing. Uh, we're going to have over 30 fuel cell test stands. We're going to be able to take it from the single cell to the stack to the full system all the way to the dyno and also have an opportunity of doing our own validation and certification. Uh, in addition, there are temperature chambers from minus 40 to plus 50 Celsius, which is about 120 Fahrenheit. We can simulate going to the Arctic Circle winter and going to Death Valley in it, all in a day in these test chambers for the fuel cell system, for the battery, for the electric motor, and also this vehicle dynamometer. All this is meant to accelerate the development simultaneously of the truck and of the station, and that's what we're doing here in Arizona. So here's a, oops, here's a rendering, uh, as you'll see in a minute, of our eight-ton station, and I'll let uh, John tell you what's behind the curtain. So here we give you a little sneak uh, peek into. Uh, hold on. That's right. Oh, I think it's moving on to a different one. Okay. Oh, yeah, so it's not. You see? Okay. So here we are. So this is basically uh, a bit behind the curtains. This is the uh, hydrogen production and fueling facility. It's an eight ton facility. Uh, and all the way to the left hand side, you see the electrolyzer proven and tested electrolyzer. One stack produces one ton a day. And as you can see, uh, as you can see here, eight uh, stacks are put together in the cluster. So, so uh, beyond that, we start to compress the hydrogen. Um, and then we have put in uh, 10 ton uh, of storage. Uh, so that's basically what you see in the middle, 10 ton of storage. That's slightly more than a full 24 hour production. 10 ton of storage gives quite a lot of flexibility. I mean, when you try to renewable, you may have also some flexibility, but it also allows for rush out. Oh, if you have trucks right. coming back to back to back and you want to fuel a lot, uh, it allows for that flexibility. That's, that's really uh, great. And then the hydrogen is cooled according to the standard, and then it's piped out to the to this dispenser bay, it's separate dispenser bays for, for heavy duty and separate dispenser bay for light duty. And I believe that you will show what this looks like kind of in the, in the, in the bigger picture now. Exactly. And one thing I want to mention is one of the reasons why we chose Nell, they've been doing the electrolytes for over 90 years. So they've been, they know this like the back of their hand, so to speak. And uh, they've also been putting stations all around the world. They just, they've been in California, in 
Korea and also in Europe. And this is, a, a, some of the technology is based on light duty, but we're also developing heavy duty technology as well to increase that capacity. And what we're gonna show you is also gonna be shown in the hydrogen booth. This is a preview of our eight ton a day station. And, but it's much more than just a station. Remember, we're building our, our, our hydrogen infrastructure where the customers are. So we're building them right next to these, these large truck depots. They may have 80 to 100 trucks a shift, three shift operation or more. And we're gonna show you a flyby. I hope it works. There it is. Yes, we all stand. <laughs> So we're going to show you a flyby. And you see right in the center here, that's our store. And that's really the center location where people can go up during fueling. That's the light duty dispensers. There's four of them. And we're going to focus a little bit on the heavy duty dispensers. There's eight of them. And if you see, oh, by the way, this design is from Steve Jennison and company. Thank you for all the hard work in getting this done. That's the uh, Nell dispenser with the nickel design. And you see the, the bamboo, the bamboo touches. We are also renewable. We're also a green company meaning all of our sites will have solar, solar on, on top of rooftops of the buildings and also on the dispensers. And one thing that's interesting about the store is also it houses, you know, when you have 18 megawatts at a station, what's an additional megawatt? So we're actually, we're gonna have electric vehicle charging. This is a Zev station, replacing petroleum, if you take a look at it. And this is a DC fast charging calling SAU uh, standard. Also, we're partnering with Ryder for our service phase. So Ryder's gonna be helping us also when we have changing the tires or regular service intervals. You just pull up to the station where you usually fill and you can have, have a service there. And what you saw behind the curtain, or, uh, uh, which we've shown before, this is the hydrogen building, which has hydrogen safe openings in the top and also our power generation. We're missing the logo here, Nicola and Nell powering the world. <laughs> but this is, this is a over of our eight ton station. Oh, what a great concept. Really, really nice. Thank you so much. A lot of hard work on behalf of the rest of the team. So what I'd like to say, just uh, show you the near-term timeline, and then we'll talk about this, this rollout just in, in words. Uh, our first demo station is already here. We're already testing light-duty fueling. We're already testing heavy-duty fueling. And our R&D station is in the works. We already have things are, are actually being shipped over the ocean with our electrolyzers from, from Nell, and we're in process with, with developing a few, the last few nits and, uh, nuts and bolts. Uh, that's happening all first quarter of next year. Uh, the year after that, we're gonna have a year of testing, and then the year after that, we're actually gonna be doing uh, this eight ton of day station somewhere in undisclosed location right now in California uh, area, where we're gonna be testing a whole fleet of vehicles in the field next to a customer using this eight ton of day station. And right after that, once we get some field experience, we're gonna start to ramp up for the production of our vehicles in 2022 at the end. And we're gonna start the ramp up of our stations, first 10 stations, and then ramping up exponentially after that. So this is our vision of, of hygiene at scale. If you, if you want to build a new type of disruptive vehicle. You have to build the infrastructure that goes along with it. And that's something we learned from the field of, of electric vehicles. But we're really learning in the field of hydrogen is that in order, in order to get success in the market, you have to build the infrastructure. And that's something we're, we're doing partnering with now. So to conclude, we are selling hydrogen to our lease customers. It's actually part of this bundled pricing you'll hear more, this total cost of ownership. But we're also selling hydrogen to the general public, to heavy duty customers, and also to light duty customers. And we mentioned this a second ago, but this same location means we can get critical mass of hydrogen, and we can have, uh, using this uh, scale, scale up process, we can get the cost of hydrogen down to the consumer. Uh, if you take a look, we heard before, the $6 a kilogram, as long as we have that four cents a kilowatt hour, that is more, less than half the price of, of hydrogen just over in California. So we're, we're achieving eight, uh, our, our hydrogen scale with an eight ton station. But as I mentioned before, or I should say, as John mentioned before, that's 150 vehicles. If you have a location that has 300 vehicles or 600 vehicles, then you have to scale up to the, to the 32 tons. And that's where you see a lot of cost benef benefits to the hydrogen. We're also seeing, uh, in order to develop this, 
currently. We're going to be uh, adding a hydrogen R&D center here in Arizona. And that is actually something that's under construction. And one thing I want to say, and, and, get, and give, an, give an opportunity also, uh, perhaps we can have a question if there are some. We're, we're, this is a vert, vertically integration. That's why you see this team that's coming in from around the world, from engineers, designers, and, um, and technicians. Because we are actually building the vehicle with the infrastructure, but also we have a plan to roll them out together succinctly. Nicola, we're bringing the Class 8 trucks, as you've heard, and you're going to see a presentation in a minute. Yeah, and then we obviously have to try to follow you the best we can, huh? So, so uh, and we need to ramp everything up together. So now we have a big facility in Denmark where we are able to produce a lot of fueling stations, up to 300 stations per year. Uh, we have made an investment decision to expand our capacity in Norway. But we're also tying in with a lot of uh, partners here in the U.S. for producing uh, everything that is non-core, not exactly the electrolyzers and the fueling station key components, but everything around it, the steel frames and everything, we can actually utilize local supply chain to do that. And all of this is ramping up at the same time. So, you know, we need to be ready uh, and ramp up at the same time as you are ramping up and rolling our stations. And obviously the station needs to be there. It needs to be sitting in the ground and producing available for customers when the stations are coming. Exactly. So we need to be a bit ahead of you uh, so to, to basically get this off the ground. Exactly. And what we're doing right now is working in, in, this, in this partnership that we have together, putting together the technology from now uh, in, our, in our stations. And we're also bringing, bringing to mark this, this heavy duty truck also, it's something that we, we're really proud of. We're working together with other industry partners to make this a world standard. So, thank you very much. Before you, before, before we, <laughs> yes. so, sorry for interrupting you. Uh, we have a bit, we have one minute huh, left. I think there's an opportunity for questions. Too. Yeah, but let me let me just let me just hand this uh, over to you, uh, Jesse. So, on the back of uh, our hydrogen car, back in Norway, we have. Thank you for the ride, dinosaurs. We'll take it from here. <laughs> So, so I want to and we have a cap here that says thank you for the ride dinosaurs. If any one of you would like one, we have probably more back at the stand there, but I would like to hand this over to you and thank you for the opportunity of basically being part of this. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good forward to it. All right. So I tell you what, we'd like to open this up for some questions. We have a microphone here. We've got about 15 minutes. Question and answer. If you raise your hand, uh, be patient, so we'll get to you. Uh, is there any uh, difference in the refinement between light duty and heavy duty hydrogen? Quality? Uh, when you say refinement, I'm no, sorry. Uh, Re refinement. Oh, requirement. So the answer is they have the same safety requirements in terms of pressure and temperature. Exact same quality. Yeah, so the quality between the, 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 the uh, light duty and heavy duty is are exactly the same. Uh, there's just different uh, speeds to get there, essentially. Yep, okay, another question? Hi there. Critics often say that hydrogen production is neither efficient nor environmentally conscious. Uh, I'd like to know what you have to say to those critics. Obviously, you're going to be producing hydrogen in a zero emission way, but a lot of people are focusing on the efficiency rather than the end. Right. Well, hydrogen or fuel cell vehicles are, are twice the efficiency of their internal combustion counterparts, even when they're hybridized. So they're much more efficient than, than the previous, uh, or than, than, the, than the fossil fuel uh, uh, variant. Uh, though you see more, so uh, the energy efficiency of, of, of electrics being higher, the issue with electrics are range, especially, you know, if you want to just compare the two, um, you, you have. Uh, with trucks, you have to add about seven tons more weight just to have the same equality. But the interesting thing, getting back to your point about, about the environment, you said about, that's what I said about the beginning, taking the vehicle out of the carbon equation, is that if you produce hydrogen from renewables or low carbon, it's much lo lo less uh, harmful to the environment. There's no CO2 or low CO2. There's no NOx, because NOx you have to have had a certain temperature. There's no particulate matter. Uh, so that all, all those things uh, are out of the equation when you when you turn to hydrogen renewable hydrogen. Yep. Uh, we've all seen those pictures of the uh, famous Hindenburg blimp going up in flames in New Jersey. Uh, 
Does hydrogen make people nervous? Do you tell them about it? There's going to be one of these coming to their neighborhood. Is it a not in my not in my backyard thing you have to overcome? So cer certainly that that exists. Uh, I should say that you know just taking a step back, hydrogen safety is, is is at the top of our list of priority for all of our companies. And it's very important to understand that just if you take a look at these tanks, if you look at a bulletproof vest, it's about this thick. If you look at the carbon fiber on on, a, on, a, on our tank, it's about this thick. They're very very safe in terms of, of the, the storage. Um, it's very interesting that people mention uh, Hindenburg. The, the Hindenburg was actually, so Dr. Addison Bain, who was actually on the hydrogen safety panel, looked at it. The reason why the Hindenburg went on off is because it was covered in a very highly flammable uh, coating. So one thing that's interesting about hydrogen is that it goes up very quickly. It's uh, 14 times more buoyant than air, and, which means that it doesn't cool. And if you compare it with fossil fuels, that the water, or excuse me, the water, the, uh, the liquid fuel goes underneath the vehicle and stays there. Hydrogen is much safer in that regard. So each one of our uh, vehicles follows the global technical regulation, the SAE standards. We have a very high level of safety and confidence in our vehicles. And that also goes to the infrastructure. I think that, that was more of, a, more of a topic which we heard a lot of questions about earlier. But I think, you know, now, at least from my perspective, and when we install stations in different parts of the world, you know, it's not really a big issue anymore. People understand that uh, people have accepted that you know it's basically taken care of. I had a question about the water that's used in the process. Does it have to run through any particular filtration or distillation aspect uh, before it could be used? Before, in terms of the different stages that you have in place. Well, the, the, the beauty with the alkaline electrolyzers is that they are uh, pretty robust when it comes to also the water source. So obviously it needs to be filtered, but it is no really advanced water treatment purification processes or anything like that. It's really a, just a simple water filter. Okay. Jesse, in early, earlier presentations I've heard Nicola talk about a price per mile as a part of a lease arrangement. In That's this correct. presentation you mentioned only the six dollars per kilogram, but didn't That's talk about the per mile cost. Yep. So to, to answer your question, the lease customers will have this 90 cent per mile rate that's constant for all fuel and all mileage within a million miles seven years. The six dollars a kilogram at, with profit, you know, with, with sale, that's meant for the customers that are public that roll to the station and fuel. Important distinction. Yes. Thank you for pointing that out. Uh, Uh, right now, the, the biggest hurdle is, is ours on the, on the fuel system, uh, on the fuel cell. <coughs> so that's why we're building these redundant test stands, because we, we want to we test or simulate up to 20,000 hours. And that's the reason for this large test center. Thank you. In the Aton station, uh, we had solar cells on the rooftops. I didn't see a solar farm or anything. Do you have enough service area? So we are intending, to answer your question, we are intending to, to also couple where there's land to have solar farms. If you want to get that kind of energy, you're going to need it. Uh, but keep in mind, what you saw behind us is the layout of the actual station. And we're probably not going to have much more solar on the actual layout, but we have to have additional solar in, 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 in the land perhaps attached to it. Hi there. Uh, where will you get your fuel cells from now when you're not developing with the power supply the development program? The, well, we haven't released the information about, about the fuel system, uh, but we are uh, working with uh, large, lar we're working a lot with large suppliers. Um, it, this, we're looking, to, in fact, many of the components on our vehicle are actually, some of them are already in production, uh, some of the valving, uh, and the tanks are, uh, are from the supplier, we're not, we're not really going to mention. Okay. You said something about an eight-ton station filling about 150 trucks a day. How much does a truck take to fill? How much? Volume or whatever. I don't know what the, you know, a diesel truck would take, you know, 250 gallons of diesel fuel. What is a... So that's, so, so the, the, the kilogram weight is, is the amount, is the amount of hydrogen. So that means that, uh, 
80 kilograms transferred to the vehicle as a full tank. I think the full tank is 80 kilos, but uh, probably not everyone is coming in with an empty tank. Yeah? Yeah. So the average filling will maybe be I don't know, 50, 60, 60, 60 something right. like that, yeah. kilos per, per, uh, per fuel. And, and what John said, we're actually replacing one-to-one -one diesel experiments, mm -hmm. you know, the range and also fueling. So if the customer drives uh, 300 miles each way, you'll probably be filling the 80. But most of them won't be doing that, which I'm saying probably 56%. Okay. Good morning. Uh, over here we have a law we call uh, the tools rule or Murphy's law. Anything that came along the Can you keep a little bit closer? Thanks. I was describing Murphy's law, which is anything that can go wrong will go wrong. Right. And I imagine when you do these installations along the major corridors, uh, if you will, travel. Truck travel lanes, they're going to be spaced based on, a, on the range of the truck so that there'll be enough reserve left in the truck if they have a problem. My concern is if you're going to be making a product on site and you only have one processor, for lack of a better term, making this product, if that processor goes down, and I know you do have some reserve, but that's where Murphy's Law comes in. Yeah. The problem is those, these trucks are running on this hydrogen. They don't have an option. They can't go to another uh, truck stop to get fuel. Yeah. They're stuck right there. Will you have redundancy or ability to respond to uh, repair this processing system before you run out of product? I think it's, it's a, uh, I don't know if you remember back to the picture I saw you where we cut off the roof, but. We are very much focused on exactly what you're pointing out, sir. We need to have redundancy. Yeah? So the eight cluster electrolyzer can, can run two in, in two and two pairs, which means that not everything is going to go down, as you said, if, if that's going to happen. We have the same redundancy on compressors. We have the same redundancy on cooling. We have the same redundancy on, on the storage part. So you can actually run a quarter of capacity, you can run half capacity, you can run three quarters, you can run full capacity. You, we believe that there is a lot of safety built into it, that, that this will actually not be an issue. Exactly. What you're referring to is range anxiety. Uh, and as so John was mentioning, every one of these compressors that we have, we have four right now on the heavy duty side are redundant, that they can actually go to the other dispensers and follow through. And also, one thing we didn't get into is that each one of these stations has the ability to fill mobile trailers that we can take we were meaning to have these trailers to use for um, actual sale of bulk hydrogen. We can take, fill up a trailer at 50 megapascal and send it to, high, uh, to California and make a little profit, for instance. But oh, it's another option as well as we're commissioning a station to take one of these trailers and bring it to another stair 300 miles away and bring it to that trailer, bring it to another station. That's another form of backup that we're also putting in our system. So, super interested in the renewable content for the energy coming in, and so how much is going to be needed per station per day? How many megawatt hours of energy? I, I can just say that we're at 17.6 exactly, you know, for, for the for it, in terms of megawatts that we're going to be using for the entire station, and around ballpark, we want to have a minimum of of, of 30, 40 percent renewable. And if, if at all possible, 100% more. So that's that's the ballpark we can say for now. Oh, hang on. Yes. Uh, can you tell us uh, approximately how much land each of these eight ton stations will occupy? How you are obtaining the land, purchase, lease, borrowing, and uh, uh, how many? these stations will be in North America or in the U.S. specifically. Okay, so we are in process with, with looking to working together with Nell on, on, on a reduction of, of area. But right now, if you take a look, we're about the same footprint that as a Love's truck stop. So maybe maybe something towards seven or seven to ten acres. But if you take a look at what we're doing in the next few months or in the next year or so, we'll show you some of the innovations we have on reducing the area from there. You mentioned the truck being a 700 bar fill up system. No, the absolute vast majority here goes into actually producing the, uh, producing the hydrogen, basically splitting water. 
that's you know 95, 96 percent of the, of the energy goes into goes into that part. Of it. The rest is almost negligible uh, when it comes to compression and cooling compared to the uh, splitting of the hydrogen, producing the hydrogen itself. Good morning. In America, there's approximately 170,000 gasoline stations throughout the country. Mm -hmm. Each one of those gasoline stations averages mm -hmm. about 2,000 gallons of aid. Mm -hmm. You're talking about eight ton stations um, of hydrogen, which is roughly 7,300 kilos. Now, based on the 2,000 gallons a day average, are you placing these stations along just major thoroughfares across the United States? Because 7,000 kilos a day is far more than any one station could even consume in general usage in the general public area. You, you're absolutely right. That's not our plan. Our plan is to, our first and foremost is, is to supplement or have these stations next to these depots where they do have a need every day to fill up of 80 to 100 trucks a shift or more. And that's where, and we're, and we're trying to place them in harm and as much as possible where the light duty vehicles are going. But our main, our main goal is, is, and you may, may or may not know, next to these depots, they have some kind of dedicated gasoline or diesel, diesel stations for these trucks, and we're doing exactly that with hydrogen. I think also it's fair to say that, you know, since Nikolai is, is handling both the chicken and the egg, you have the opportunity to actually plan where you deploy, how much you deploy, and where you would like to build your infrastructure and exactly. how you prioritize it. Exactly. So I think it's the beauty of the whole case here. And I don't think you really need as many fuel stations as you have across the America today. Right. I mean, when you look at the utilization, it's pretty low. You can actually handle uh, less. But if you plan the routes and you, and you build that infrastructure uh, accordingly, it will be overall much more efficient. For people to build themselves. It's very easy to, 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 I mean, I drive a, a fuel cell vehicle, a uh, hydrogen car every day myself. Mm. Uh, my, my, actually, as a matter of fact, my wife wants to drive it, so uh, with my kids. <laughs> it's very easy. You connect, you push a button, and then you can sit down and, and you can read your paper and everything happens. It stops automatically, you just disconnect and put it back. Exactly. So very, very easy. It's going to be exactly the same. There, the there are 5,000, just as, as it, I, I drive a fuel cell vehicle too, as well to work, uh, and I should say there are 5,000 or to, uh, Toyotas and Hondas in, in uh, LA area, and they've, they've had, not only is it a, a standard, they do it every day, safely. And we're following the same standard in light duty, and we're using that experience to develop a safe fueling uh, process for heavy duty as well. So uh, we want to thank everyone here. Uh, we're, we're actually out of time, but for, for joining us at Nicola, joining us in our session. Thanks, John, for the hat. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much.
Did you get some sleep last night? I'm in my tennis shoes today. I'm, I'm done. I'm like, I was in my dress shoes and suit all day, so I needed to take it a little bit more relaxing today. I didn't pack a t-shirt. Sorry. <laughs> Um, very excited to very excited to be here today. Um, today's all about the truck. This uh, these two minutes, or this the session is is for us to be able to explain in detail about the truck, um, from the overall viewpoint to the engineering viewpoint with our partner, uh, along with the design viewpoint of of uh, our, our chief designer. So it's really exciting to be here today to talk a little bit more freely, a little more fun. Uh, we'll probably do some question and answers as well. Um, this is just going to be a pretty relaxed session and, and uh, kind of cool. So I hope you guys all enjoy this uh, this breakout. Let's see if we okay, good. We're we're rolling. All right. So I'm Trevor Milton. I'm um, the founder of Nikola Motor Company. The next sitting next to me is Jason Roy. Jason, you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, I uh, work at the Robert Walsh Corporation, and I'm in charge of our commercial vehicle business here in North Carolina. And we also have next to me uh, uh, Steve Jennis, who's our chief designer. And yours comes up in a little bit. We'll introduce you there. Um, so some of the things about this uh, this this truck was really it all came down to styling, styling, aerodynamics, efficiency. It was the it was kind of the the center focus of this truck when we built it from the ground up. Was how do we build a truck that was unlike anything that had ever been built. Not just to be different, but the fact that it couldn't work on an existing platform. There's no reason to change something that's not broke. The problem we ran into when we built this truck was is that if you take an existing diesel and you put a uh, fuel cell on it, if you look around the world, you'll see kind of like the Toyota's done that with Kenworth, and they get, the truck goes 100, 150 miles and very limited power. The problem is you can't do that on it. That won't work. You need to compete with the diesel. You need to be able to beat a diesel. <coughs> so we knew from day one we had some serious uh, problems. Uh, we needed to figure out how to redesign the truck because we were forced to, not because we wanted to be different. Um, so we really did. We built this thing from the uh, from the ground up uh, to be to be different. Some of the main points about the truck are the fact that it's one is zero emissions, a really important thing. I, I believe in the next 10 to 15 years, diesels will be banned all together around the world. Even, I, I think it'll even happen here in America as well for a lot of states. Maybe not all of them right away, but California's already come out and said they're going to. So we didn't want to uh, be stuck in a situation where we were forced to react. We wanted to be a leader. We wanted to be the first ones. We wanted to be able to say, look, it is achievable, it is possible. Um, with that, you had to have something that was high performance as well, that was actually, you know, if you're just zero emission, but you're less performance like the other fuel cell trucks, no one's going to buy them, unless they're running like in a port or a very limited, uh, limited area. And on top of that, if you don't have a low enough cost of ownership, no one's going to buy them again. So it's almost like you have to beat them on every category, that's why we talked about it last night. It's the only semi-truck that can beat a diesel in every category. That was during the unveiling. Those words were um, very importantly placed in that spot for a reason. Uh, up until this point, the reason why zero emission has never really taken off is because there's always a problem with it. It's either too expensive, it's not powerful enough, you can't work on it, or whatever other reasons are out there. And with Nikola, we finally were able to design something that would beat a, uh, a diesel in every category. But not just this, but both the Nikola 2 and the Nikola Trey, right. they run off the same platform. There's nothing different, just to let you know. So some people have asked, how long did it take you to develop the Nikola Trey? Well, the great thing is once your platform is done, all your motors, your hydrogen tanks, your fuel cell, power electronics, controls, all that, it's actually not that long. This, uh, this development will come out a year after, in production, a year after our, our Nikola 2 here in the US. So the, the US production starts in 2022, Europe 2023. So just a little bit of work. It's mainly around serviceability. What you have to learn is how do you tear the thing apart to fix it. Um, we could have a truck out quite quickly if it was just to build a truck, but the hardest part about owning a truck as a manufacturer is building something that you can actually service afterwards. Because as a driver, the only thing they really care about is uptime and money. That's what they want. Now they have other, they have other things like zero emission important to them, but they, if they're not making money, they, they lose everything they've worked for in their life. So that's a, that's a big deal. 
Montana trucks pretty hot. <laughs> We're just letting the, the video play a little bit. This was some of the very first shots that we ever did uh, with the truck. And talking about the fact that we had a beat of diesel in every category, we built this truck with a thousand horsepower per act per set of tires. So there's four tires in the rear of the truck for the US version. That means you can have up to 2,000 horsepower if you needed it. Now there's a weight penalty for that. So 90% of the fleets around America will only order it with one set of axles or drive axles. There'll still be all four will have suspension, but only two of the tires will ever be driven. And that's because of weight. You'll save about somewhere around 2,000 pounds by going to a single drive driven axle rather than dual driven axle. Maybe even a little bit more of weight savings. Um, you also need the, the, the torque. In one single set in the rear, one set of tires driven, 2,000 foot pounds of torque. Um, over 700, up to 750 or even more miles per fill up on hydrogen. That takes about 15 minutes to do. So an interesting thing is, uh, you know, a lot of the media is asked, uh, this morning I was in media uh, questions and answers all morning, and they asked, you know, how, why, why electric, why high, you know, and why high hydrogen options as well? Can't one kind of do both? And I tried to touch on that last night, but here's, here's a quick um, engineering explanation for those that want a little more technical. And I know we were missing a lot of details last night, but that's because I had to pack three hours of work into one and a half hours of, uh, of you know, of a, of, a, of a show and do it without putting you guys to sleep. So mm -hmm. that was a, that was a, a fun venture. But here's what it comes down to. If you have a, in, in our Nikola 2, it's not up here right now, it's outside. In the Nikola 2, there's over three megawatt hours of energy stored in the hydrogen. That's 3,000 kilowatt hours of energy stored in the tanks. What's really incredible is you can store 3,000 kilowatt hours or three megawatt hours of energy. And it only takes 120, or I'm sorry, 160 pounds to do that. To give you an idea, it takes it would take 30,000 pounds of batteries to equal that. That gives you an idea. That's just batteries. I'm not talking about the rest of the truck. So, in reference, if you were to look at, say, the uh, the Tesla truck, a lot of people know about the Tesla truck. I have a lot of uh, sympathy for what they're going through in their company. I, um, they have. Uh, the world's putting a lot of pressure on them to, to succeed in every category in the world. Um, so I, I personally know that they're going through, it's, it's been, man, I feel, I, I kind of feel, I, I feel, I feel for those guys a lot, and it's one reason why I don't want to go public. Mm -hmm. I want to make sure that I can go slow with this and make sure I do it, um, do it without the pressure of the financial world bearing down on me. Mm -hmm. So I, just to let everyone know, this is not on the, not on the actual presentation, but if I was in that situation, I could not, I do not believe I could have done any better than what um, Tesla has done. These guys have done a, a great job. A lot of people thought that we, you know, that we um, don't like Tesla. It's actually the complete opposite. We like Tesla quite a bit. We want them to succeed. There's enough room for everyone to win. Uh, the, if they succeed, we, we win as well. If they fail, it hurts us dramatically. We don't want them to fail. We don't want them to take our design, but we don't want them to fail. And I actually, I feel, I, I, and personally, I'm always rooting for him to, to win. Um, so if you think about this, the, the, the entire truck, how do you, um, how do you get all this energy, this, this 3,000 kilowatt hours of energy on board the hydrogen truck? The Tesla truck has one megawatt hour, a little bit more than actually, about 1.3 megawatt hours, so 1,200 kilowatt hours of energy on the truck. So that's one third the energy storage on that truck than the hydrogen truck. That's a problem because what you need to be able to do is go long distances. That's where hydrogen really shines. Um, electric does really well inside the cities. And, and we talked a little bit about that last night, but there's a place for everything. Hydrogen does not fit every application, nor does electric, battery electric fit every application. They're each individually owned. So the hydrogen truck weighs about 5,000 pounds less than a battery electric version if you were to try to compete side by side with specs. It's actually a little bit more at It'd be probably closer to about 7,000 pounds, but they'll, uh, they're not going the same distance we are. So currently right now, we're about 5,000 pounds less than a, than a diesel truck. Well, in the trucking world, every pound's worth 50 cents a load. So if you're doing a load from LA to Las Vegas, and you're hauling, uh, let's just say meat, 
Well, on that road right there, you'll lose, you could add another $2,500 worth of freight on that road with our truck compared to an electric one. So if you're doing a load every single day, that means you're, you're, you get $2,500 in every load, every single day, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars a year in additional revenue by having a hydrogen truck. So when people say, oh, the economics of hydrogen doesn't make sense because the efficiency of hydrogen is less, you're true, you know, part of that is true. The efficiency is less, you have to convert it, you have 30, 40% loss. But what you have to understand is two different points of views. One is the fact that the, um, the additional cargo that can be loaded on every load is actually real money. You can't get that with, a, with battery electric on those routes. So you can save hundreds of thousands, or make hundreds of thousands of dollars more revenue every year with the Nikola truck over, a, over the Nikola battery electric truck on a, on a long haul. Uh, the second one is, is if you factor in the entire supply chain, whereas the oil was refined, it was dug out of the ground, whether it was methane or oil or whatever nuclear, it's, it's uh, burned through a um, turbine plant to power the, power the grid of, at only a 30 or 40 percent efficiency, transmitting it through the grid for a few percent loss, all the way to where you plug your vehicle in. Do you know that you're only pulling out of energy that's only 20, 30 percent efficient in the first place? They don't tell you that. They always say, oh yeah, just look at the hydrogen, it's a, it's, it's a crazy cell, you know, it's not, it's all these efficiency losses. They're actually almost identical. There's not, nothing different in the grand scheme of the entire supply chain. There's nothing different between battery electric and hydrogen when it comes to the amount of efficiency. So we had to be able to do this to where we looked at the rest of the, of the problems and one of them was, okay, if we have this much energy, how do you fill it fast enough? And that's another advantage of hydrogen is you can fill it within 20 minutes an entire truck and off you go again for another 700 miles. Um, some of the features on the truck that are, that are uh, pretty cool is the fact that you have the unobstructed mid-cab entry. This is a patent that Nikola has. We defend it rigorously. Everyone knows that. Um, it's one of the questions we always get, we don't comment on. But this is an important thing. Why is it? If you were to look at, um, it doesn't have a laser actually. If you were to look at where the door is, it's behind the seat. This allows you to enter in behind the driver's seat, much like a cockpit of, a, uh, of, of an airplane. That gives you a lot of benefit. Here's where they are. Number one, you can move the driver forward almost four feet compared to a conventional diesel. The aerodynamic drag can, re by, can be reduced by 20 to 30% over a current diesel. This is why we defend that so rigorously. Like, we're like, look, we don't care if you can build any other truck out there. Just don't use our design or anything similar to it that has what we call the fuselage, the cockpit. The mid-entry door is a, is a utility and a design patent we own. And that's a really important thing to us because we've solved complex problems that no one else did. And we did it first and everyone knew it and that's an important thing for us. That's our edge on the world. That's how we can stop the people with billions of dollars, other automotive groups that are, maybe they're, they're European or, or other groups from squash us. And essentially if they squash us, then what happens, this truck goes on the shelf and you'll never see the light of day. That's why patents are important to protect. The other one is the enhanced visibility, being able to see out the window. Next one down is the integrated steps. They're fully motorized. If you, if you looked at the truck out there, the Nikola 2, you'll notice when it came out, it, there's no steps. And as soon as you open that door, the steps power down. And it allows you to have three steps up into the truck, whereas currently, trucks only have two. So this is, a, Essentially, there's a total of really four because the platform of the truck's the other one. So it allows you smaller steps into the truck with four points of contact the entire time for more safety to get in and out of the truck. It also reduces that drag. The next point is, is the regenerative braking. The bottom right on this graphic is regenerative braking. I talked a little bit about that last night about how a current diesel with air disc brakes at full speed takes 65 feet close to, plus or minus, to, en to, get, to engage the dead band all the way through and engage the, brake, the braking horsepower of the calipers. With the electric motors that Nikola has on all four wheels, you can initiate the braking sequence within a few feet, within milliseconds. So ultimately, overall, the number's not published yet, we'll have them out there once they finalize all the testing and the validation, but you're probably somewhere between about 30 and 60 feet total of 
saving of, of how quick you can stop compared with diesel. The regulations right now are between, I'm not sure exactly what they are, I think they're between three and 400 feet right now is what the government says you have to stop at from 60 miles an hour down to zero. We can shave 10, 20, 30% off of that um, over what is currently available with diesels. And that's really neat. It's all about safety, it's all about how many drivers, I said this last night, how many drivers would be saved if you could shave 50 feet off the stopping power. If you went and looked at all the wrecks on how many drivers died, and if they had 50 feet more, how many would have lived? I have an obligation to society to make sure this technology comes to market. I have an obligation to future families that are gonna lose loved ones because they didn't stop in time. So this is why we're pushing so hard with this. Along with advanced driver's assistance, um, these are just some of the, is this one on, is this, uh, no, you keep going. I'm not sure where yours comes in, actually. <laughs> I'm just letting you roll, I'm gonna let you jump in. You know what, this one, I'm gonna let Jason jump in on this one, because this is the Bosch product, um, so I'm gonna let Jason jump in on this one. Yeah, well, uh, thanks. What, what you'll see on the uh, upper right there, and a uh, little bit of peak on the upper left, and even a little bit integrated in the top screen in the, in the middle, uh, this is all part of the digital mirror system that uh, Bosch and Mecklenburg have developed. Uh, what you'll notice on these trucks, you'll see it on the tray, you'll see it on the ones outside. I'll talk a little bit more about that. Looks, there, there are no exterior mirrors. And uh, we like this for a lot of reasons. We like it for aerodynamic benefits. We also like it for enhanced safety because uh, we have the ability now to take the sunlight and reflection out. We have the ability to enhance night vision. We have the ability to add driver's assistance aids to these visual screens. And, and basically give the driver unobstructed view under any condition. So we're really excited about that technology. It's a good fit for what the Nikola team wants to do with the truck in terms of efficiency and the coefficient of drag. But also, as Trevor just indicated, uh, having this truck be, you know, using all of the latest safety technology, we're, we're proud to support it on that truck as well. Uh, you know, one thing about those mirrors, Jason, you can maybe talk about this, is the fact that uh, current trucks have multiple sets of mirrors all over the truck. They have them down low, they have them up high, they have them everywhere. The great thing about cameras are you can put them all over the place, and software is getting so advanced that it can, it can tell what the driver wants to do and display what the driver needs to know. So you're able to get humongous displays of like what the driver's trying to get. Yeah, um, so contextually too, what, what they need to see. So when the truck is in reverse, you might get a different view. When the truck is slowing down, you might get a that uh, a better enhanced front view. And uh, I'm really excited because one of the things we get to do a lot with Trevor and his team is to do a lot of innovation. And I, I like the fact he said he wants more cameras on the truck because we will have the ability to put those a lot of places. That can, ha that can enhance security, it can enhance safety, it can enhance liability for the fleet owners because all of this data, all of these, these, these uh, visual inputs will be there for for the record, be there for training the drivers, be there for keeping the truck safe. So we're really excited about this technology. One thing that's really cool about cameras are is the fact that they have logic behind them. Uh, current mirrors have no logic. There's nothing behind them processing data. So what's really neat about cameras are is that you can build in all kinds of things. There's been a lot of studies shown that if you add color to something, it allows people to process data much faster. So imagine as if you're, dr if you're, if you're driving and all of a sudden you see something red, you didn't have to process that whole image to find out if someone was coming into your camera view. All you saw was red. You didn't need to know what was going on. And so there's so much innovation that can come around these cameras where a driver, the cameras can process data that mirrors cannot process. And the idea is to give them better visibility, better coordinate, you know, better bird's eye view around the entire truck, and understand what other cars are doing too. Is their car coming up on him really fast that he doesn't even know about? The camera can actually dictate that let the driver know long before the driver starts to merge into that lane. Yeah, there's there's a lot of possibilities, so we're really excited. You know, one of the things I would say about the, the Nikola truck platform is, um, and I liked uh, how Trevor had said it back in 2016. Is anybody in Salt Lake City in 2016? Anyone? He's, That's awesome. Great, me too. And uh, uh, he started it off with a, a great saying, and I love it. Electric light bulb didn't come from continuous improvement of the candle, right? Mm -hmm. So, so we had uh, we heard Trevor say that, and at Bosch we just love that, right? Because we got to jump in. This isn't a this isn't an evolution of the truck. This is a revolution. So we were able to work with Trevor and his team to put every building block into this truck necessary 
to uh, have it be you know world class uh, when it comes on the market. Yeah, one of the things we did look behind is you'll see the entire. It, this is a real demonstration of the display, um, an entire display of the of the infotainment system, which is just awesome. There's a 21 inch 4K display in the middle with a almost a it's a 12 point something inch, almost 13 inch one in the front of the driver for the instrument cluster. Uh, it eliminated a lot of the buttons that were there with very easy voice activated controls on the steering wheel. Driver can say set climate to 67 on driver side, set climate to 85 on passenger side, <coughs> turn on seat warmers. We don't want drivers looking at doing anything, looking for buttons. We want drivers to talk as they're driving with the push of a button. That's what Nikola has been able to do. Yeah, another great example of contextual information, right? Only the information necessary for the task at hand, not information overload. Uh, we're, we're glad to see Trevor really taking the lead here. Yeah, I feel like we really are the ones that are, that are pioneering this. In, in the trucking world, and there's been so many people before us that have pioneered it on the, on the car world. Once again, I, I drive a Model S test, so I love it. And it's a, it's a 100, it's a Model 100. And they, what they've done is they forced OEMs to simplify their garbage. It's amazing, you get into a really nice car and the infotainment systems are so complex that they don't even work. And you get into a Tesla and the damn thing works, well, it's just beautiful, it's just so simple, you're like bump, 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 great, works. You know, everyone has issues with their cars, it's okay. But they, what they've done is they've inspired people to fix all their crap. Turn it into like, take the software world that we have unlimited access to right now with all these software developers. And one thing Nikola did that no one else has done around the world is we turned our entire infotainment system into an HTML5 computerized system. It's a supercomputer. It's the only one like it that we know of in the world. And what that, it's what, it's what they call a hypervised unit. And what's cool about this is, is this HTML5 is what every programmer, there's millions of them around the world know. This is a standard language for most all computer programmers. So what we did is, in the automotive world existing, there's all these really complex kernels of chips that you're allowed to use for automotive because we've been tested. And we just said, you know what, we're building the whole truck from the ground up. We don't want that stuff anyways, it's slow, it's 10 years out of date. We want instant, we want 4K, we want video conferences, we want everything, we want people to be able to, you know, as they're parked, chatting with their, with, their, with their kids and their wife and their dog. Whatever they want to do, they want to, we want to give them the ability to add apps to our system. You know, whatever you want to do, that was never able to do on a truck until we came along. So what we did is we built this system that is a full HTML5 basic computer programming language that's incredibly secure. Imagine the billions and billions of man hours that have gone into securing computers. There's still vulnerabilities, no doubt. But there's more protection around, for instance, like the Apple, computer system or, or you know, see the, all the C code that runs all these computers. That's what we built this on. So we have these supercomputers that run and it runs everything. So the color is actually the same between the screens. One thing you won't know is in the automotive world, the color schematics between the screen that's in front of you and, uh, and the other screen that runs your music and everything is actually different color tones. The reason why that is is because they're actually run off of different computers with different code. It's a total disaster. So we just got really frustrated. We said, we're done with it. We're going to run it on the same computer system with multiple levels of redundancy. So this is, you can actually see up here, anything from the phone system to service to climate control to everything else. Let me, let me take this. Yep, there you go. But to go back to that, you, know, you get a real live example of role Bosch plays here uh, with Trevor. Um, we, we try to do, execute everything he does in a safe and secure way. So one of the things that we did with, to help him in the vehicle yeah. architecture of this truck is to enable all of these things to talk to each other using the most secure communications available in the mobility industry. You know, so you, you can think of this truck, uh, you know, having having uh, more antivirus, anti-hack, everything else to make to enable everything to talk to each other, but to do it in a secure way. And that's one of the, the things we're really proud of. There's a picture of those uh, very sexy Mechalon rears mm -hmm. tied to the digital rear cam system. There's a short example of. Uh, of what the, the video the drivers will see, uh, but I think we talked about this. So I want to talk about one more cool innovation we have on this truck, and uh, uh, I want to start with the phone here. You know, and basically, 
what we are talking about is, uh, is what we call in uh, Bosch our perfect tequila system. So uh, what we have is the, we won't have a key on this, on this truck. And uh, the keys will be secure digital keys. And there's a couple of neat things about that. Not, not just for the fact that you have uh, an ease of operation, but when you see this, uh, this gentleman walking up to this truck, this truck knows, okay, my driver is coming up to me. So those lovely steps that Steve and Trevor will talk about will come down for him. The truck will start its preconditioning. And we're not just talking about an app that's on the phone. We're talking about a link system that's embedded in the electrical architecture of the truck. So this offers many advantages for, for the systems, for the op optimization. Um, and what's really cool about it in the commercial vehicle industry uh, is you no longer have to say, hey, do I have the right key for this truck? Or I only have five different drivers on this truck. We can actually transfer this secure digital key seamlessly from one driver to the next and also upload all that driver's personal settings, yeah. that, that driver's uh, recording history. So another building block technology uh, that, that we're really proud to, to work with Trevor and have him innovate on this to, to have it on his, his truck. Yeah. I think what's neat about that is that the keys, anyone who drives trucks right now knows keys are a major problem in the trucking yeah. industry. Whether they go into service or whatever it is. Um, also, theft is a big problem. Um, making sure trucks are not stolen, torn apart for parts. And with the Nikola truck and, and all this keyless entry, the stuff that Bosch is doing also, perfect for the keyless, it pretty much makes it impossible for trucks to be stolen. They have to have full authorization. They have to have the phone there or other ways of overriding the, uh, the, the phone authorization. If they lose their phone, they can still get it in the truck with different yeah. codes. There's so many layers of security here, and essentially just, it just prevents people from uh, from going down the path of having unauthorized access to the truck, theft, or sitting in the truck waiting for it to heat up. It can tell he's walking towards it. It knows he's gonna go on a route. It knows what time the next load needs to be delivered. It's gonna have that truck ready for him at whatever temperature he wants by the time he gets in. One thing I love is I have, I have, I have dogs. I'm a, anyone here have dogs? Raise your hand if you have dogs. I love it. I am a, I'm an animal lover. Uh, truly am. I have, uh, I have an eight-year-old Labrador and uh, a uh, eight-week-old uh, Rottweiler puppy. And one thing I've noticed is, is that animals are hypersensitive to noise because they hear so much better than humans. There's a lot of diesel trucks that noise is a, is a major problem uh, for animals. The continuous noise actually affects them. And that's one of the really neat things about Nikola is the fact that you can you can have your pets with you now. It's fully climate controlled. You can leave it. You can leave your pet in there for a few hours in the summer heat. It'll stay whatever temperature you want. It'll display it on the on the windows for people walking by to know that your dog's not in there dying. You can be any. You can see what's going on with your phone. It'll call you. It'll alert you. And if it can't call you and alert you, it'll call someone else and alert them. If the system were to shut down, and it were to get over a certain point of temperature. It literally is a. Like, I'm using my own personal experiences in my life to make sure that our team of engineers are engineering, you know, all these features in. And there's tons of drivers that have told me about this, too. It works so, with your spouse, too, by the way. <laughs> you know, so uh, one of the, that's one of the cool things is once we put all these building blocks in place, then a lot of innovation can happen. And as the innovation happens, we've also made this possible that it's all over-the-air updating, you know, so... Uh, you, you'll see a lot of things in this truck that if you drive a, one of the more advanced vehicles that you're already used to, like new features getting rolled out, diagnostics getting rolled out, real-time things, uh, that's, all, that's all possible. And I want to show a little bit, so apologize to any children in the room, we're going to show the truck without any clothes here. So what, what you'll see here is the, is the chassis, and what I wanted to highlight uh, here before I give it over to Trevor is uh, speaking about the building blocks. Um, you can't really see it too well, it's a little dark on my screen, but uh, we have uh, full electronic electric steering in this truck. That's also a building block. And, uh, you know, uh, one of my colleagues, uh, Bosch from the steering, was saying, you know, Trevor, you should have, uh, you should have a, a lady out there driving, driving that truck and just ripping it around the corners without any effort at all because that's what you can really do now with full electric steering. What you also have is a building block for automated driving, so lane keeping, automatic cruise control, all of these things are tied in. And uh, I'm, I'm happy to say that, you know, Trevor is going to use the Bosch servo trim for his incredible men. And a lot of them don't want to be in this because either one, it's not a safe environment, or either two is it's not a it's not an environment that's like, oh yeah, I want to go drive a truck. 
So what we did is we, you know, we knew that driver shortage was a big problem. Autonomy will come into play down the road and it'll fix certain aspects of trucking, but it'll never replace drivers altogether. So what we wanted to do is build a truck that was so, had all the features of this. I mean, my wife always tells me about things that she wants in the truck. She's like, Trevor, we need this, we need that. What about this? Have you thought about this? Well, from a woman's perspective, Trevor, what about this? What about having the ability to have a, a green light inside the truck that tells a woman that there's no one around the truck within a 15 foot radius? Have you thought about that? I'm like, no, those digital mirrors will tell you. They're part of the system, right? So the whole, the whole Nikola truck, all that logic, they'll actually tell, tell you if there's anyone around your truck anywhere before you get out of it. I never thought about that. I've never worried about things like that. And that's what's go so great is my wife is incredibly involved in the design of features for, uh, for, for women, even though she's not a truck driver. And then what I do is I go take those and I go down to the truck stops and I, I really have notebooks of me down at truck stops. I mean, weeks and weeks of, you know, where I was at truck stops sitting down with drivers who had no idea who I was asking. Like, hey, I'm, doing a, I'm doing a report on trucking. Can I ask you some questions? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I would just talk for hours and hours with these drivers, and some of them were women, maybe a few percent. And it always made me sad that there wasn't more women in it. So this is our chance, this is Nikola's chance, to bring more women into the trucking world. A truck they can be proud of driving, a truck they can feel safe in driving. And that's ultimately what we're breeding in the culture at Nikola. We're, we're very, it's a, it's a big part of us. We cannot succeed without uh, in, you know, increasing this this market giving everyone that same opportunity. Um, let's go to the next. Yeah, I just have one more thing to say because uh, if you notice in the back there, Trevor mentioned those 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 E axles and uh, uh, those E axles have in, inside of them the most state of the art Bosch motors possible, highest level efficiency, 450 kilowatts pack max power, um, operating at the efficiency levels that are benchmarked to anything on the world. So I had to mention that. I was going to get to it. It's great. Very very proud of that. So these motors are amazing. There's a, they're, they're literally 500 horsepower in each wheel. We used the Bosch rotor and stator in this. It took a long time to integrate that into our e-axle. And we now have the most efficient e-axle in trucking in the world. There's no one even close to it. Uh, that's a very awesome uh, thing to be able to say. In an electric platform, whether you're hydrogen or battery electric, every quarter percent is, is magnified to the max because it's so efficient that it's the only thing screened and I'm inefficient and affecting the whole supply chain. And with e-axles, you can see a difference of over 10% from one company to the other. Our, our e-axles are more efficient than any other e-axle on the market, and I'm pretty, uh, in heavy duty trucking, I'm pretty excited about that. We love them. There's, there's one back there in the back, you can take a look at it. So now, now it's my, now you can introduce uh, uh, Steve uh, Genis as well. Steve's our chief designer for Nico Motor Company, and. Uh, Steve has designed this truck, both the Nikola 1 back in 2016 and the Nikola 2, and had a lot of input on the Nikola 3 as well. So if you guys can give a round of applause to Steve Janis for a great job. Thank you. It is so hard, Steve, to design a truck that is good looking. Yeah, it takes a thousand, hundreds of thousands of hours and a lot of late nights. My wife can attest to me <laughs> staying up late nights on weekends working on this thing. And, uh, and having a great design team as well. Everything from the inside to the outside, Steve, was heading up the team line. This truck is truly stunning. From People have said it's, it's too nice to be a truck, is what they told me. <laughs> so the trucker's going to ruin it. You know what? The idea is we want to give them something they can be proud of. What they do with it is up to them, but the idea is we want Steve has really done an incredible job building, uh, building that. So in 2015, when I started working with Trevor, we more or less had a clean sheet of paper. We had a, a we could, he wanted something which the, the industry hadn't seen before. Uh, we, we know we wanted to be aerodynamic, but also we knew that we had the freedom of a skateboard platform where you didn't have the, the powertrain in front of you that could move it down in between the frame rails. And in so doing, you could push the driver forward. So uh, Very similar to the train. I mean, that's where it all, you know, exactly. all came from, was the idea of a bullet train. Yeah. So when I first started drawing, and what's led up to this truck is a 
what I really wanted was a clean, simple, simple profile and uh, with dynamic window graphics. And the, um, from the front, I wanted a, a, a stance to the vehicle that was, uh, that was impactful. And the more I developed the shape, the more I started, the more I was drawing this vehicle, the more it started to um, resemble something that I had ridden on a form of transportation that I used in, uh, in Europe and Asia. And that was a bullet train. Mm -hmm. And I was really impressed when I, when I wrote on these in the early 90s that um, it, it was, it's a form of transportation where you can travel at 180 miles an hour and complete safety and silence and, and, and transport all the, the passengers and cargo in an amazing amount of time. So uh, as I was drawing this vehicle, I, I, I used that as my inspiration. And the, the resulting shape ended up being something very aerodynamic and spacious, spacious inside. Yeah, Steve, I mean, uh, the actual rear, the, most, most day cabs, your, your seat is right up against the back of the cab. You have over four feet of room behind the driver's seat. Unlike any other cab in the world, there's only a 210 wheelbase. We plan on getting that down to like a 190 and uh, somewhere around there for production. I mean, just tell me, explain how much room. It's incredible. You've got two benches and a seat and everything. Yeah, it, the overall concept of, of the interior. The interior is spacious. And I've talked with uh, truck drivers about this. And one of the things that they love about the interior is the amount of space. Especially being a day cab, you'll never get this amount of space inside of a day cab. You just have a wall right behind you. Like Trevor said, there's four feet of space behind you. So there's a thousand different things that you can do with that space. You can put um, uh, an office environment like what, what we've designed here. We, you can design a wrap system. You can put a sleeper cab. And so there's, there's a lot of yeah. things you can do. One thing I want to touch on is that we got a lot of questions um, after the unveiling event on social media about why did you guys stop building the Nikola One, the sleeper, us drivers, that's what we need. Real quick, they are actually the, the same exact truck we have not stopped. This, the, this will be the new design, the Nikola 2. But the Nikola 1 will be the exact same thing with just like a couple feet on the rear for the beds to go in. So it'll literally use the exact same platform that Nikola, the Nikola 2 designed on so that you're only building one set of tooling for a truck. The rest of it is identical. And there's so much room inside that we only have to extend the rear of this thing of the Nikola 2 by about two feet, you can now put queen size, you know, full size beds in there like the Nikola 1 was. So that's what's really important for you guys to know is that both the Nikola 2 and the Nikola 1 are slated for production at the same time. There is no difference. And, I, and I, it was a point I missed last night. We got a lot of questions about it. Drivers frustrated that we had left them out. And it, 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 was, just a, it was just an oversight. Um, they are exactly the same truck. One will have beds in there and a refrigerator and all that cool stuff. The other one will have office chairs that fold down with a table uh, where they don't need beds. So in the trucking industry, as Trevor mentioned, there's a shortage of drivers. And I thought to myself, how do we solve this with the design? What can we do with the features of the design of the vehicle? Well, we already have a, a clean uh, fuel cell technology. And we have an all independent suspension. So you have a really smooth ride, which is, which is really fantastic. But what can you do to entice drivers who want to join the industry? And what I thought was, you can give them what they, what they don't have now. And what they have now are plastic interiors, cloth seats um, that are not comfortable to ride in for you know, from eight, 10 hours. Um, you can improve the level of their environment not only for, you know, to introduce new drivers, but also the experienced drivers out there who want to come over and drive a Nikola uh, truck. And stay in the industry. A lot of people yeah. are leaving right now because they're exhausted from it. Or the new generation has no desire to go drive the diesels. They're not attractive trucks. Some of them look pretty good, but they don't want to go sit in a, in a noisy diesel and drive in 10 hours a day. So the idea was to actually recruit, to build something so gorgeous, so beautiful, such a statement. If you looked at the rear of the Nikola 2, it looks like a Lamborghini on the rear. It's the most beautiful rear fairy I've ever seen in my life. And we got so many compliments on it last night. Um, that's how you attract new drivers. Yeah, so with the, 
with the, uh, the, the materials, the one thing I wanted to point out is that we, if, you'll get a chance to walk through the, the red cap outside and you, you'll see a lot of leather and suede. We, we had suede on, we used suede on the headliner and on the instrument cluster, we used suede. The rest is double stitch, double stitch leather on the instrument panel, the door panels. And like I said, it's, it's to entice people to want to to be inspired to drive. Yeah, that's really right. that's really why we did it. So I'll go to these design. Uh, oh, yeah, okay, that's <laughs> right. So really quick, um, on the front view of the vehicle, the, with with the, the large grills, we need a lot of the, in this particular version. We need a lot of cooling for uh, the, the fuel cell. So we we knew that we needed. A large grill, so I wanted what I wanted to do was break it up with a horizontal band so you don't have this huge uh, grill in front. And the bottom grill has a horizontal line which ties into the headlamps and helps the vehicle to look stable on the road. Again, that was one of the important things that from front view I wanted the vehicle to look solid and stable and wide on, on the road. It's something you could recognize from a distance of a quarter, half a mile. And that goes into the, the headlights as well. Um, this is, with, with the headlamps, um, I wanted the thinnest profile possible for a truck. Right now, trucking lamps, I don't think they're, not, they're that much better than what you can get on a car. The throw isn't that much better. And what I want to do is up the level of, of, of uh, safety for the driver. It's really what it was about. So, um, and from a design standpoint, I wanted a nice profile. So what we did was I, I forced the engineers to go out and find the smallest projector they could possibly get. We actually found projectors off of the Le Mans race car. Uh, and, I've, and that's what we used in this vehicle. And they're very yeah, This is a very distinct look. I mean, I think it's probably the best looking light package I've ever seen on a semi truck in my life. And you'll see it from a mile away. Like, you'll know what's a vehicle a truck. There's nothing like it. Yeah. So, um, the, the three C's are, are, are a trademark of ours uh, that we're patenting. Um, it's not shown lit up here, but the, the two C's are uh, sequential turn signals and also the, the large C around it is uh, also a, uh, a turn signal marking light as well. And uh, additionally, there's, a, there's an integrated intake in the, in the bottom there for the cooling. So on the, on the side of this, you can see that the, in the overall profile, um, we, it's, this is showing the mono volume shape that, great, that gives us really great aerodynamics. Um, the, the shape is unbelievably aerodynamic and uh, we're still in the process of working, uh, working out some little surfaces right now. So I, I can't give you an exact figure, but um, the previous truck was in the threes, was in the point threes. And um, this one, what's amazing about this one is that the, the, the previous generation, I call it, had a narrower cabin. And for this one, we wanted enough space between the driver and passenger. So that forced the, the uh, sidewalls out a little bit. Um, yeah, we had a lot of room. I think yeah, like, no, there's a lot of room. I was looking like a foot or something between it. Something. Yeah, we, we measured like 19 or 20 inches. Oh, even more. Yeah, almost two feet of room was added inside. Yeah, because that was really important when you're getting through the rear of the vehicle that you can pass.
I don't know if you noticed, but I lost a little bit of weight from the last one three years ago, so I'm doing okay, you know? Um, young Reducey has that unique ability to uh, convince people in a way that is around. He wants a company to succeed on its own. He wants a company to have all the assets they need to succeed. He wants the, com uh, the company to have resources throughout the whole state. And that's what he did for me when we came down was he, he introduces all the people inside of uh, in, in this room for dinner. They're all leaders around the state. And it was, uh, to tell you the truth, no one else had done that. And I, I'm so happy that we're here. We're going to be building thousands of jobs here in Arizona. It's a beautiful place to live with beautiful weather. It's a melting pot for people all over the world. There's millions and millions and millions of people within a few miles of our of, of our headquarters and our factory, and I could not be more proud than uh, to have you here, Governor Lucy. We're, we're thrilled you're here. We know that you looked at every market available in the country. We couldn't be more proud that you chose Arizona. Arizona right now is one of the fastest growing states in the country. The county we're in right now, Maricopa County, is the fastest growing county in the nation, two years running. A lot of people have said that Arizona has a lot in common with California, and I'd say that's true. We both have a lot of Californians. <laughs> uh, a lot of people are leaving a place that is raising taxes, increasing regulations, really making it tougher for entrepreneurs and innovators to scale a business. We want to be the exact opposite. I know that a governor doesn't create jobs. They create the environment in which jobs can be created, and we couldn't be more pumped up that you're going to be creating 2,000 jobs here in the state yeah. of Arizona, Robert. Governor Ducey, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. division all the way to our, our trucking divisions. And it's a night of, of memories, really. That's what I wanted to create. The Nickel and Reckless is something that is, uh, is, is very special I'm to me. Trying to get it, so. it's, a, it's a product that was designed, and Andy will go into this in a little bit, but the product was designed to be special. Special to the special forces. Special to the families of the special forces. Reckless was designed, as you notice, it drove up here without anyone in it. Andy will be going over this later tonight. All of our technology around Nikola is around not just now, but remember the word future. That's what tonight is really about, is the future. Thank you, Trevor. I'd like to start by publicly recognizing the military representatives that are with us this evening. We've got 12 different countries here. How about a round of applause? It's so awesome. Thank you for your service and welcome to Nikola World. As someone who has served the Special Operations community for over 28 years and 12 deployments, I know firsthand that having the right equipment is critical to mission success. We built the Reckless to have one piece of equipment that has all the mission critical versatility needed. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a saying in the Special Operations community that humans are more important than hardware, meaning that people are our most precious resource. <laughs> I want to share with you a story of how Nikola is solving complex problems for our military. Imagine a pitch black night in the desert. You can hear a coyote howling from miles away, and any sudden engine noise will echo in the surrounding canyons. A Special Forces team has to na navigate on night vision and needs to move over 70 kilometers in rough terrain to an enemy target. They must remain undetected and completely silent. Failure and compromise, not options. Ladies and gentlemen, we designed the Nikola Reckless vehicle to give our soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines a decisive edge on the battlefield. 
This vehicle is also remote control capable and autonomous capable, meaning it doesn't require human operation 100% of the time. Standing to my left is our professional driver, Brett. Brett, put your hand in the air. Brett actually piloted Reckless to this exact spot tonight using our remote control feature. Pretty amazing. I can tell you all about the performance specs. Thank you. I can tell you all about the performance specs of the Nikola Reckless, and we're going to cover that tomorrow in the breakout session. But we built Reckless to solve complex problems for the military with virtually no sound and no heat and the ability to be fully submerged in water. The Reckless provides a new meaning to stealth and versatility. Ladies and gentlemen, Nikola is not only defining the standard, we are defined the standard. At Nikola, we believe deeply in transformation. It's at the core of everything we do. And we believe that military vehicles, all of them, will transform to electric and hydrogen fuel cell powertrains in the future. The Reckless is just the beginning, just the beginning of where we're going to go and solve complex problems. I invite all of you to the breakout session tomorrow. You're going to see Reckless in action with our amazing partners. You know, what's amazing is that um, the military has minimal emission regulations around the world. That is because they have to ensure the vehicle's performance and reliability. So that means these vehicles can emit whatever pollution they want anywhere in the world without repercussion. What we didn't want to do is legislate them into forcing them to get rid of it uh, necessarily off the bat. The idea was to actually show them, hey, look, you can get rid of all your emissions. You can make a safer environment so that people can come home to their families. We can protect our countries, every one of us, no matter where we're from around the world. And you can do it without wrecking the environment around you. This is what I love about Nikola Reckless. And <laughs> how cool is that? It's an amazing technology. And the bottom line is we're building a very safe vehicle at solving problems and giving new capability to, to, to our military. We're going to give the military a vehicle and technology that they have not seen before with this electric reckless vehicle. Thank you, Andy. I appreciate it. Uh, that was trying to focus. You want to play? Thank you, everyone. Um, I'm going to ask someone to give me some water, too. <laughs> Sorry, I'll look for a bottle over here. <laughs> Thanks, Matt. Come on. This is a, an enjoyable time for me right now. What I get to do is tell everyone around the world more about Nikola right. in a way they've never known. Yeah. This is our time to let everyone in, in to the company as if they were part of a family. When we first started this company, um, the, one of the requirements I had is that none of my engineers could have worked for an existing trucking manufacturer before. Hmm. I wanted to make sure that I could recruit, recruit people that thought anything was possible. I had met with engineers from other trucking companies, and the first thing they told me was, that's not possible. Or second one is, that oil companies will squash you. Third one is, they'll drop oil down the abysmal price to prevent you from coming into the market. Fourth one is, you need to take an existing diesel and just retrofit it. Fifth one is, is they said, no, actually, um, it's going to cost too much money, and we doubt you'll ever make it. So all legitimate um, you know, concerns that people have. But the problem with the existing trucking engineers is they're, they're in an environment where they're taught to do a certain thing, a certain way, to make it incrementally better. I didn't want to make it incrementally better. I wanted to make it a complete transformation from the beginning to the end. It was very similar to iPhone. It's what I love about Apple. It's not, I, we call the iPhone a Chucky, is what we call it internally by Nikola. Apple is an incredible company, not just because of their hardware, but because of their software. Nikola is not just a, not just a company because of its truck. It's actually a company because of everything else that includes the hydrogen fueling stations along with it. But where do we all start from? We started in the basement. We started in my basement, actually, like so many other OEMs. And I'm going to talk about that later on tonight. We already talked about why we came to Arizona. There's a lot of other great states out there as well. The hard part for me was I needed a lot of people. I needed an area also that was very good weather. I wanted good solar energy. I want my plants to be completely zero emission. 
all of our hydrogen is already zero emission from production to consumption. So why not make our facility zero emission from manufacturing to delivery? So we needed that, and Arizona is a great place for that. We have 130 people here at our headquarters now. There'll be over 300 by the end of the year. We'll have thousands of people here hired in Arizona by, by 2022 in production. And by the way, one, I'll tell you right now, it's a great thing. We are on track to meet our production timeline in, in 2022. So if you can give everyone, that's a big deal. We have a fuel cell facility we're building, intellectual patents that we're, we're creating right and left as fast as we can. The media is watching us from around the world. This is our time to shine. I've always been a power sport enthusiast. I'm a diehard. I love the outdoors. I'm a pilot. I love to fly. Not a great one yet. Hmm. A decent one. I love the mountain bike. I love everything outdoors. I love rock climbing, I love river rafting, and I love water. One of the times that I was out riding a UTV was out in the sand dunes of the Coral King sand dunes. Our belt had blown on our UTV, which means your entire off-road vehicle is shut down. You can no longer use it. This is a, a one we bought from another manufacturer a long time ago before I started it. I got so frustrated that I decided, I was like, now I've, I've, I've just got to change this. I have this technology from, I have this technology from our trucks. It's so much money invested. There'll be over a billion dollars invested into the Nikola drivetrain. Well, this is why other OEMs have not done this yet. If you look at the competition out there, they can't spend a billion dollars on an off-road vehicle. They'll never make their money back. We already had the technology. So what we did is we took that technology and we said, look, we're going to share the product. We're going to share this technology across our different markets, and let's create some beautiful brands that can really tell people what we stand for. I wanted to get rid of the belt. I wanted direct drive. I wanted something with instant power, something that was gorgeous, something that was very unique. In order to do that, I needed to find the perfect person to help me accomplish that. I called up my team. I told them, I said, hey, look, we, this, is the, this is what we need to do. We're going to build this thing. And they're like, oh my gosh, sure, we got a truck program. What are we how are we going to do this? We decided to do it. And the next step was to find the right guy. After looking for some time, it took, a, it took some time to find the perfect person. And this guy is very unique and very well known in around the power sport world. It's my pleasure right now to introduce, ladies and gentlemen, Michael Erickson. <laughs> Oh, 
The world is ready. This is so cool. Uh, this night really is full of surprise. We have so much fun, so many vehicles to show you guys to actually unveil tonight. We've been working on this product for over three years now. We finally got a, we finally get to show the world the new NZT design. When we unveil this, pay close attention to the workmanship, the interior, the exterior. It rivals some of the best automotive engineering in the world. This is on an off-road vehicle. This is a moment that people from around the world have been waiting for. They've been waiting to see the production intent NZT. NZT stands for net zero toll. That means we want to leave no footprint where we've been. I am so excited to be able to show this off to the world. People from everywhere, live stream around the world. We have reservations from all over the world. Thousands and thousands of people waiting to buy the NZT. Ladies and gentlemen, the Nikola NZT. something that would change the whole entire industry. We wanted something that was not just fully enclosed, where you could take on and off the roof, on and off the doors. Something with full HVAC, so heating and air conditioning. It's the first one of its kind in the market with automotive uh, air conditioning in the side. Keep the dust out to allow your family to enjoy. Imagine if you have young kids, you don't want to breathe the dust in the entire time. After this event, you'll be able to walk around and around the edges of it and peek inside, take photos. You know, just pay attention to the design. There's emotion in the design. There's the luxury, the fit, the finish. It empowers you, it energizes you. Imagine no noise in the state parks or the canyons, all while having the performance of a supercar. Think zero emissions. It's as unique as you are, as dynamic as your personality. It engages your senses, and it's time to replace the noisy gas meter. Absolutely, Trevor. She is beautiful. And like you said, with fully enclosed, automotive-like fit and finish, climate-controlled, dust-free, high-tech cockpit, and luxurious touches you'd expect from a vehicle, an experience so refined. This vehicle, unique, it is a superior disruptor, and frankly, it's a new class of vehicle. Take note of how NZT measured up to adjacent product categories. It's got performance that's more like a trophy truck than a UTV. It's got technology like a premium EV and is designed to higher safety standards. It certainly is exciting to advance vehicle design and the consumer ride experience. For those in attendance and to learn more, attend the Power Sports Breakout session tomorrow and to experience the electrified NZT, sign up for a demo ride here tomorrow. Trevor? Yeah, I'd like to thank uh, all of our current reservation holders around the world. There are so many people who have been waiting for this. So thank you so much. Come see it tomorrow. And uh, it's going to be a very uh, very enjoyable experience for everyone who has not, who has not been able to see it. Thanks, Michael. Experience any of these places up close. 
We are all off limits for internal combustion engines. No access allowed. That is, until now. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome an industry pioneer in the electrification of watercraft and the VP of Nikola Power Sports, Jordan Darling.
the idea is we want to get away from the emissions, get away from oil or gasoline spilling in the water when we throw up away from it. Get away from the noise and the pollution that's left in the water when you're, when you're skiing or, or riding away brothers. The consumer spoke, Nico will listen, and we built the wave. We built the future of watercraft. The goal was to build an aggressively bold design inspired by superbikes. While complementing the wave with a sophisticated technology package, giving the rider complete control, confidence, and the most unique connection on the water. With the Wave, we are bringing technology nor normally experienced in high-end automobiles. Think LED lights, digital displays, over-the-air updates, and even cruise control on the water. Truly a first of its kind. Yeah, this, is, uh, this really is a first of its kind. When you look at this thing afterwards, look at the display on this Wave. It's this big. It's amazing. It's a beautiful 12-inch fully digital 4K display on this watercraft is completely submersible. That means you have no issues. You're going to roll it over. You can submerge it. You can play with it. You can dunk it underwater. You can have fun. It doesn't matter. It won't hurt it. So if you want to be the first to ever own it, experience it or play with it. You can reserve it later tonight at NicoaMotor.com. Absolutely, Trevor. If you're interested in diving deeper into the Nikola Wave, please join our breakout sessions tomorrow. I will personally be there, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you all. I'm gonna need some more water, guys. A couple more, probably. What's really interesting is to think about how all this fits, how all this uh, interacts with water. Water is one of the most abundant elements that we have. Hydrogen is the most abundant element in the atmosphere. We believe that from the beach to the mountain ranges, we truly need to care about our environments. People say, why is Nikola building off-road vehicles? They're a truck manufacturer. You're right, but the thing is, who else is going to do it? The other guys don't care. They're only doing it because we're doing it. They don't actually care. If they did, they would have already done it before. This is what drives me insane. It makes me so mad. So if we have to go out and pioneer it, to force these other guys to finally do their damn job, I'm going to do it. I want to preserve. <laughs> Thanks. Preserving our world is a primary motivation. I needed it. I needed to figure out how we could create enough energy to power everything we desire, whether it's trains, whether it's ships, whether it's automobiles, whether it's anything else. Power plants. We needed, we needed to figure out a way that we could create enough energy that would be indefinitely recyclable. One of the only elements in the atmosphere that allows you 100% recycled energy is hydrogen. It's not the most efficient source of energy in the universe, mm -hmm. but it never goes away and you can reuse it forever. Mm -hmm. There's actually when people talk about hydrogen and the energy it takes to create it, one of the things we always tell people is just a few hours of sunlight that is not captured by solar panels around the world is enough to power the entire world. The real travesty here, travesty here is, uh, is the fact that we're not capturing all that sunlight, not that it takes a little bit more to create hydrogen. Energy is actually abundant and almost free nowadays. We have a great team in front of us. Um, some great suppliers that you'll see that provide solar panels for our hydrogen stations. You can now create energy out of water and indefinitely reuse it over and over and over and over again indefinitely. I needed the right guy to help us accomplish that. The biggest problem I had is, okay, so you know, we can build this truck. How do we build the powertrain? How do we build the fuel cell? How do we build these hydrogen stations that are incredibly complex? How do we build protocols the world can get behind? I needed the right guy to help us accomplish this. I knew from a very young age, my father's somewhere here in the, in the crowd, he taught me that my greatest strength is recognizing my greatest weaknesses. I needed to fill my life with people that were better than me in so many areas of my life. And this is what we did. I filled my, one of the areas I filled was with a gentleman that is one of the top experts in hydrogen around the world. The best. I needed him to help me build, our entire team build, 
the fuel cell, the truck, the stations, the high pressure, the storage, everything about it. Ladies and gentlemen, the Vice President of Hydrogen for Nikola Motor Company, Jesse Schneider. So Jesse, maybe you can tell me a little bit about this fuel cell lab. It's incredible. I mean, ultimately, we need you know over 300 engineers. We're going to bring all the testing under one roof. And this is important because we needed to be able to build something that, from the beginning to the end, all in house without having to send it all over the world to be tested. We needed everything from the dyno chambers to the climate chambers to the fuel cell and battery test beds. So this was important to us because. Without this fuel cell testing lab, it would be impossible to bring this truck to reality. So maybe you can yeah. tell me a little bit how excited you are about this oh, uh, world-class fuel cell lab. It's going to be awesome. We're having, uh, actually, we're, we're uh, building up 30 uh, fuel cell chambers right now, which have uh, also looking into battery test stands and fuel cell. And it's also going to have everything to be able to test a single cell, a, a short stack, full stack, all the way up to a full system in a climatized chamber. That means we can simulate going to the Arctic Circle in winter and going to Death Valley in the summertime and actually do that under load with a full dynamometer, everything under one roof, as Trevor was mentioned. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the key here is to solve the chicken and the egg. This is what has plagued the hydrogen uh, industry for so long. So we started with the chicken and the egg. We knew we had to build our own facility. All of our own hydrogen production, Nikola built. So when we sell trucks, we sell them on individual routes or within a city. And we build these hydrogen stations in order to make sure that they can support the trucks that we, that we, uh, that we sell. So Jesse, tell me a little bit about the network, how many, how many stations we're going to be building and everything else for the audience to know. Oh yeah, so, so basically we talk, we've heard a lot about the chicken and egg. We're not building the chicken and egg, we're making an omelet. We're bringing, we're bringing a few cell truck to market in yeah. 2022, that's right. But at the same time, we have to, to time it right, have stations come, come in with our fleets. So we're in a lucky position as a as a hydrogen provider slash fuel cell maker. We're going to be putting these stations right next to where these warehouses are. We're going to start off with a few stations and go exponentially to 10, and eventually we're going to reach 700 stations to meet the, the, the demand that we have today. Yeah, it's pretty incredible, because if you think about it, that means by the start of production till 2028, we'll be building almost 100 stations a year. Wow. <laughs> So just one of these stations is larger than just about any other station in the world. So we're talking about building 700 of them. And we never build them on speculation. We build them on based upon orders. Now, there's not a lot of money to be made in hydrogen. The idea here is to drive the cost down from a mass production level to make it economically feasible to sell a hydrogen electric truck. So in order to hear all about this technology tomorrow, uh, you know, make sure you come and you visit Jesse and the CEO of Mail, who provides our electrolyzers at the breakout room. Thanks, Jesse. Right, thanks, Joe. Now I'm going to 
chance to introduce someone uh, pretty cool. This is, um, as you guys saw, I got, a, I got the chance of coming in on the uh, Anheuser Busch uh, Budweiser Clydesdales. <laughs> They're amazing uh, horses. <laughs> They're beautiful. And we have a great relationship with Anheuser Busch. Anheuser Busch placed an order for 800 trucks with Nikola. Yeah. <laughs> You know what's more impressive than 800 trucks is the fact that these trucks will drive 800 million miles with zero emission from beginning to end. <laughs> Our relationship with Anheuser-Busch was built on a foundation of a couple principles. They needed uptime, they needed reliability, they needed to be able to fill fast within a few minutes. They needed to be able to run the trucks continuously. They needed a truck that was as light as a diesel. Nikola was the only company in the world that could deliver that. At that time, tons of people thought we were totally fake. There's some individuals that are not here tonight that actually called us frauds. I didn't invite them. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay, they're probably watching the live stream. Our idea here was is to actually show the world this can finally be done. Anheuser-Busch is a great partner of ours. They allow us to begin rolling out all the stations to prove the entire concept to the world. These are hard orders. They're not ideas, it's a signed contract. We are delivering trucks to Anheuser Bush. It's my opportunity to introduce the VP of Sustainability, Ingrid Durek. Nationwide, we travel and deliver our products 
over 350 million miles every year, and that is across all modes of transportation in the US. I've tried to do the math. I cannot even calculate how much horsepower that is. That we need. So this is why we are continuously looking to lead the market by driving, by driving efficiencies, by leveraging data science and bring innovation and sustainability in our logistics network. Nikola is one of our partners and we are proud to be working with to make our dream of bringing people together for a better world a reality. <clears throat> So we decided as a company, as you saw a few months ago, that we're going to offer our powertrains, which is the exact same thing, just without a fuel cell, 
for those that want to have a battery electric version as well. They're incredible machines. It doesn't matter which one they are. The next step in this process was how do we make sure that each one can fulfill its obligations? How do we build these trucks? And how do I find the right guy to help me build these trucks? I'll be talking a little bit later tonight about the battery electric options of both our Nikola 2 and our Nikola Tray. We're going to get to that later. But right now, what I want to talk to you about is the gentleman that I had my team help me recruit. Our team looked far and wide for the right guy to help us build this manufacturing plant, help us build this company. As I said, I know my weaknesses. I'm not an expert at building plants. I'm not an expert at manufacturing. I'm an innovator. So I wanted to find someone around me that would complement my weaknesses. The previous company that I owned was bought by a company called Worthington Industries. They do a couple billion dollars, I think four or five billion dollars a year in, in uh, revenue. They're one of the leaders in the world with, uh, with high pressure vessels. They do everything from multiple types of gases to natural gas to hydrogen to everything. So they already knew this and they're incredible manufacturers. They do propane, they do everything. Mark Russell was a guy who was the was the president of Worthington Industries when they bought my previous company, which led for the ability for me to invest that capital into Nikola. I had reached out to Mark multiple times, and through a very good series of events in life over a period of a couple of years, we were able to bring Mark Russell on as our president of Nikola Motor Company. It's my pleasure right now to introduce, ladies and gentlemen, Mark Russell. side for a number of years with you. Been through a lot. I can't tell you how fun and exciting it's been to be along for this ride where this whole thing went from being an idea and a, and a vision in your brain here to where we are tonight. It's, it's been unbelievable. And uh, to be standing here with you on the stage tonight as part of the team, it's a, it's a dream come true for me. Thank you. It is. Uh, you know, you're, what's incredible is that every every company needs those people that can help each other succeed. Every country needs those companies that can help them achieve their emissions. Europe has always been a leader in emissions. It's, it's actually pretty incredible. They have, a, they have legislation now that by the mid-2020s, diesel trucks will be banned altogether in Europe. And because Nikola is a, a global brand, we know that Europe is going to be a huge market for us. And Europe wants change. Mm -hmm. uh, they want something completely different. Is the world ready for something different? I believe the world is ready. I believe the world's ready for this now, finally. I think 10 years ago it would have been too premature. I don't think the world would have accepted it. I think 10 years ago, the governments wouldn't have mandated it. I think 10 years ago, society would have not accepted it. I think 10 years ago, society would not have accepted someone young enough to build it. What's incredible now is that we're actually here. I believe the world is ready for something gorgeous and powerful. How do you feel, Mark? We are ready. Ladies and gentlemen, the new standard in trucking across Europe, the Nikola Trey. <laughs> Nikola's about making everything better, 
and when everyone else is reacting, Nicola is leading, and everything about the tray is just better. Yeah, I mean, compare this to the diesels in Europe. Nicola needed a truck that could compete. We needed to make sure it had more horsepower and torque than the other diesels in Europe. Everyone would have laughed us out of Europe if we showed up to Europe without a truck that could beat the diesels. We need a thought. We, we came with this powertrain, which is the same powertrain on the US truck. Per axle, there was 1,000 horsepower or 750 kilowatts. Two axles, that's 2,000 horsepower. Now, truckers will never need all that. They're only going to use it at certain times when they're going up, when you're already at speed going up hills, or when you have a really heavy load. But we needed to make sure that we had a scalable platform. So what we have is we have a truck in Europe that'll be coming into Europe with a thousand horsepower, enough torque to climb the steepest hills in Europe, a 500 to 1200 kilometer range. That's about 300 to 750 miles um, for those who uh, don't know the conversion of uh, kilometers. There'll be 60 kilograms of hydrogen on board, so slightly less than our, our US version. You won't believe it, there's two beds in that truck. It is really incredible. Well, for those who have never been to Europe, there's two beds in that truck. When we built this truck, we got rid of the two biggest problems on a diesel truck. We got rid of the diesel engine and we got rid of the transmission. The transmission goes right down the center of the truck. When we got rid of that, what it did is it opened up to lower the, the, the <coughs> rear bed by up to one to two feet. That's never been achieved before on a diesel truck. So what does this mean? That means that we were able to build something spectacular an area where the driver could be in the rear of the truck. Sit down, it's the only truck I know of in Europe with a full factory theater system built in. I'm not kidding. <laughs> the driver can sit down in the back, throw his feet up in a comfortable position while he's on the road. The screen drops down, blocks the windows, and he can watch any movie he wants on iTunes. As you know what, that's pretty cool, right? <laughs> and the powertrain of the truck, whether it's hydrogen, you can see some of the, uh, the powertrain of the truck, whether it's hydrogen or, um, or electric, is identical. It's only how you charge it. The hydrogen fuel cell charges the batteries, or the grid charges the batteries. It's literally identical. So what we, going into Europe, what, essentially four options. You can order it with <coughs> hydrogen, as the hydrogen electric version. You can order it as a 500 kilowatt hour, you can order it as a 750 kilowatt hour, or you can order it as a 1,000 kilowatt hour, which is a one megawatt hour battery pack. Now, when you go onto our website, there's just one option to pre-order right now, and that's ultimately, doesn't really matter, you'll be able to choose that later. But I wanted to quickly give you an update about what those options are, and that'll happen with the Nikola 2 also for the US version. The Nikola 2 will have the exact same powertrain, both hydrogen that you can order, or 500 kilowatt hour, 750 kilowatt hour, or 1,000 kilowatt hour. Once again, nothing different between the platforms. And we just we just want to make no mistake with everybody. <clears throat> Emissions are the enemy. It's not about whether it's a battery or a hydrogen electric vehicle. It's about better fuel economy and a more efficient drivetrain than diesel or natural gas. Uh, the tray's design will allow it to idle and run with no emissions. Yeah, that's right. I mean, the hydro our hydrogen is created with zero emissions from beginning to end. So we only use wind, solar, or hydrogen, unless there's going to be a rare circumstance where it's not possible to even find it. From production to consumption, our fuel will be zero emissions. We can do it now cheap because thank heavens to all the solar providers like Hanwha and others, they've been able to drive the price of solar panels so low now with such high quality that we can finally build enough hydrogen cheaply or charge enough batteries cheaply that we can finally beat diesel. <laughs> Even in Europe or the US, it doesn't matter. You need to fill fast. You need 15 minutes to get going. But that's not what that's not the only thing that matters. It's one advantage of hydrogen. But what really matters is safety. The Nikola truck, whether it's the Nikola 2 or the tray, is the only truck that I know of with full redundancy. Redundant power steering, steering system, brake systems. We have electric motors and air disc brakes. Redundant controllers. 
This allows for the future implementation of level four and five. Nikola does not do all the autonomy on its own. There's 50 players out there that do autonomy. It's complicated. It's very easy to make a truck drive on its own. It's very nearly impossible to make a truck drive without ever hurting someone indefinitely. So what we did is we knew that we needed to make sure our truck was fully compliant with all autonomy hardware from the ground up. So every bit of hardware that needs to be on a truck, the full level four and five autonomy will be on our trucks. And, and other autonomy providers can come in and provide that software to all of our customers. All this is controlled by an incredible digital copy. Think about a future in Europe where Nikola trays replace all diesels. Isn't that a beautiful future? We should be able to uh, begin production in Europe in about 2023. Yeah, the production of our truck and our stations will all begin right around simultaneously around the time that we deliver the Nikola 2, about one year after. The Nikola 2 will be coming to market sometime in 2022. The Nikola Trade will be coming to market about one year after that. Now, we'll have trials before that. That's a production um, rollout. The pricing on the Nikola Trade will be very similar to the U.S., where it will be on par or cheaper than a diesel, which means you can drive it, and per mile or per kilometer, you'll pay less than you would for a diesel. That's an important thing, because we don't provide something that's better than a diesel, cheaper than a diesel, no emissions. Few people are willing to truly adopt it. I hope you've enjoyed seeing the Nikola Trey, and I hope you've enjoyed seeing what other manufacturers have said was impossible to design. Ladies and gentlemen, the European Nikola Trey. is amazing. It's an incredible market. But for me, U.S. is home. It was where I was born. For the grand finale tonight, I want to tell you a little bit about the Nikola too. I want you to understand where it came from. I want everyone from around the world to understand where it came from. This all started when I was a kid. My dad inspired me with trains. He was the manager of Union Pacific Railroad in Las Vegas. I grew up around trains. I grew up on the, on the rail yards. I grew up driving occasionally when I would uh, frustrate him enough. He would send me out with the conductors and let me look at the inside of a train. The conductor, which is the guy who you know, drives the train, would say one day he'll be smart enough to build a locomotive semi-truck. I was six years old yeah. Probably. Yeah. around that age. That's when the light bulb went off. I wasn't anyone special at the time, nor was he. We weren't the first people to think about it. I don't lay claim on that. But what it did is it was a seed. It was a seed that cultivated over my life. It was a seed of desire to build something, a desire to create something. I, had, I was very lucky. I had parents that fully supported me in everything I did in my life. Few people in this world are lucky enough to have the family I've had. I had parents that promoted me when I failed, complimented me when I failed and supported me when I failed. This was a very pivotal time in my life. It was when I was young, it was when my mother was alive before she died of cancer. This is a, time of my life when nothing was impossible. Anything is, is possible when you're a kid. And I was lucky enough to have parents who didn't tell me it was impossible. I wanted to build that locomotive semi-truck. All my experiences have prepared me for tonight. Mm. have prepared me to build the thing that I knew I needed to build. Like some of the best inventions in the world, by coincidence, 
or by happy chance, it started in a basement. My basement. This was one of the first meetings we ever had in Angel Up. It was when there was only a few of us. My entire basement and my entire upstairs and kitchen was full of computers. People have no idea what you sacrifice when you put everything you have in it. There was times where we pledged our home to make this company succeed. I've dedicated my entire life to this. I'm so grateful to share with everyone from around the world, from everyone that traveled from 49 countries to come here tonight, from everyone that believed in us. It all led to this moment. incredible view this is. These were all real video of the truck. There's no renderings there. This is the real truck. This is a real fuel cell. This is the real bag, the real powertrain, everything in it. 800 volts of real. <clears throat> Just think about the exterior of this truck, how beautiful it is. The design of this. The power and the torque of this truck being able to beat every diesel out there. The acceleration, the ability to accelerate two or three times faster than a diesel. The stopping power. What's incredible is on a regular diesel with air disc brakes, it takes 65 feet, plus or minus, to engage the brake calipers and get rid of the dead man. With Nikola, within a few microseconds, you have thousands of brake horsepower at your disposal. Imagine stopping 50 to 100 feet faster. How many people and truck drivers would be alive today if you could stop 50 or 100 feet faster than the current standard? This is what Nikola brings. Every manufacturer out there said this thing was impossible. Everyone said it would never work. Everyone said this thing will never exist. Why can't the big guys do it? That was what we got from so many people. Yet there are so many believers, so many people here that believe. The people that were willing to fly in from all over the world, the people from everywhere in the world watching this live stream, they can see it now. They know it's real. <clears throat> Think about the 
interior of the truck, the visibility shot from the front, the ability to see everything in front of you in a glass window, the ability to see the cars next to you as a driver. This truck has two seats and a table in the rear of the truck. That full down with a full-size table allows you to work. Work on your laptop, watch a movie, whatever you want to do, work on your paperwork. It's in the rear. You have four seats in this truck. The comfort features you get in this you don't get with the diesel. Normally a diesel, the hood goes up, the diesel engine comes all the way back, about six or eight feet back, and then all of a sudden the window goes up. Do you know why we designed that slanted window in our door? Very few people in this room will ever know this. Our chief designer designed that as a remembrance, but that is where the diesel window ended. And this is where the diesel window has to, achieve, has to compete with now is nearly four feet difference. The driver's able to be up here. Full LED lighting inside. The fit and finish is like you would find in a high-end automobile. No longer a grimy plastic dashboard filled with dust that a driver doesn't want to go to work in. This is an interior a driver would be proud to drive. There are displays inside. A 21 inch 4K display that gives you complete control of your entire vehicle. It tells you where all the hydrogen stations are. It tells you down the road you'll be able to integrate fragrance with. It tells you your consumption. It tells you your potentially your revenue built in, how much money you've made so far. It allows you to control your HVAC. It allows you to control everything. In front of the driver's face, another very big display. It's a, a, a 12 inch gorgeous, infotainment system and instrument cluster. The cluster's right there in front of you. Infotainment's off to the right. With very few buttons. If you look at a diesel, there's just buttons everywhere. We got rid of it. There's a few buttons down at the bottom. And other than that, the rest is digital. It's a full digital cockpit. In order to make this truck accessible to everybody, we knew we needed the best service program out there. We partnered up with two groups. One of them is wider, with billions and billions and billions of, of miles underneath their belt. They have 800 locations around the country for service. They already service trucks. They know what they're doing. We didn't want to go build our service network. Too expensive, too difficult, too much time. Then we worked with another group named Thompson Cat. We needed somebody who understood heavy machinery. Why did we choose Thompson Cat? It was incredible because Ryder knows trucks really well. Thompson does as well, but Thompson knows heavy machinery. They understand the big dirt earth movers. They understand forklifts. They understand skidsters. Every tractor you can imagine, they understand. They understand what vibration does to a vehicle. We wanted the best. We, we recruited the best people to be our partners so they could help, so we could learn from the mistakes that they've already learned. This is all about relationships. Without technology, it won't matter without people. Or with technology, sorry, with technology. Technology, it just doesn't matter without the people around you to make it incredible. What I want to do right now is invite up all the people in Eco that are still with us, which is everyone. Down here in our basement, if we didn't have Kane and Devin, or, uh, sorry, Kevin and Dane and Tony, Tony, Isaac, Jordan, Morgan, Steve, Mark, Russell, you guys can come up, please. culture we have at Equal. We truly, I mean, there's no layers of bureaucracy in our company. No one's treated any differently. When we go to barbecues, I love, like so many others, we all fight for who gets to cook for each other. <laughs> this is the culture we bred into Nikola. 
You should treat everyone as an equal. There should be no difference. We have a, we have a, a layer to make sure that we are doing things methodically, as you can tell. I think you can give the production crew here a pretty good round of applause for how well it's put together. I think we are done. Let's uh, wrap it. We will call this... from right now, you'll have a chance to have an incredible country star, Frankie Ballard, come and give you an incredible 45-minute concert. Give him <laughs> There's going to be more demos and discussions tomorrow, so everyone here, you guys get invited in the morning time before the rest of all the public comes. So make sure you come in the morning when you get a little less, it's a little less crowded to be able to